Hey guys, my name is Kent Lamb and I'm here to talk to you about how I made a viral feature film for $6,000 and how you can do the same thing too. Quick primer on the film, it's called Bad is Bad. It's a 96 minute long home invasion revenge thriller. It's right here on my YouTube channel. It's sitting at around 6 million views right now. It's also on Vimeo where it has a couple hundred thousand. It's on Amazon Prime where I don't know how many views it has because their analytics suck ass. It's definitely where it's made the bulk of its money though. We wrote it when we were 19 in college. We filmed it when we were 20 on summer break from college. And I don't think I finished up the edit and put it online until I was 21. So yes, this project took a while, but it was worth every day that I spent on it. I've learned so much making this movie. I could talk for hours about it. It literally was the pivotal project of my life. But for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna keep things short and limit myself to the five most important things that helped me not only finish the film, but make it a success. So number one, write the film based around resources and things that you have free and easy access to. You're basically gonna reverse engineer your story based around what you have so that you can make the best movie. Now, this might sound kind of constraining or limiting, like, oh, I don't get to tell the story I want because I don't have access to a, a missile silo that I wanna make my missile silo thriller in. But what you need to do is realize that all the limitations that you're gonna have are gonna end up becoming your strengths because limitations breed creativity and you're gonna have things that are available to you that other people do not have access to and those are gonna become the strengths of your film, the unique aspects of your story. So for example, for us, we were just kids in the suburbs, so what did we have? Well, Chris's parents were cool with us filming in his house for three weeks straight, so we had our main location. We said, okay, so what kind of stories could we tell that mostly take place in a house? And Pretty quickly, we settled upon home invasion thriller. We had the genre, we just had to figure out the specifics of the story. So to help narrow it down, we looked at the cast. Who do we have to put in the movie? Well, we've got Chris, we've got Kevin, and in real life, they're best friends. So it's not a coincidence that in the actual movie, they're best friends in the film. And that dynamic between the two of them, the chemistry, was to me the best part of the movie because it was like the truest part of the film. Just sit there, make sure he doesn't get away. That's all you gotta do. I know. All right, you got it? Yeah. You good? Yeah. Are you... So you can see we're just using all of our resources to try to make the best project we can with what we have. But it's not just the resources that you can put in front of the camera, it's also the resources that you can use before you even make the movie. Like I was in a screenwriting class in college, I was able to take this script that me and Chris wrote, which by the way, was our very first feature length script. Probably not a good idea to make the first feature script that you write, but whatever, worked out for us okay. But it wouldn't have if I wasn't able to show it to my professor and beg her for feedback on the script, which she graciously did. She tore us a new hole. I was so unprepared for all the notes that she was gonna give me and how horrible it was, because I was sure I'd just written the next American masterpiece of a film. Be prepared, by the way, for that to happen at every step of the way as you make your first feature film. The excitement of making a feature is so infectious. Everybody can get so pumped up about it, and you especially. But just don't get disheartened as you find out that there are mistakes with your film, there are mistakes with your script, there's mistakes in the editing room. Every step of the way, there's gonna be things that you get a little blindsided by because you just don't have the experience yet. And you know, when you're the closest person to the project, you just don't realize. So that's what happened in this case. There were just red X's on entire pages of our script that were just thrown away. And I was heartbroken. We were like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But luckily we came around, we took the notes that made sense, we incorporated them. The movie would have been a disaster without that. So anybody that you know, that knows what they're talking about with film, that knows people, that can connect you to people that know what they're talking about, take advantage of those resources, they're huge. And to be quite honest, another big resource we had was experience because me, Chris, and Kevin had been making movies and short films together since we were like 11 years old. So we knew how to wear a ton of hats. I was directing, I was producing, I did all the post-production, I did the marketing of the movie, putting it up on YouTube and sending it to bloggers and stuff like that, which I'll get to later. Chris was also an artist, so he was able to do the storyboards, he was able to do the makeup and blood effects, help produce, and Kevin too, and whenever they weren't on camera as actors, they were moving lights around and being grips, and when you're making a movie for no money, essentially, be prepared to have to make up for that with a lot of sweat from everybody involved. But it's fun, it's fun sweat. You know? All right, the number two most important thing, make a practice short film that is similar to your feature before you make the feature, okay? What that's gonna do is it's gonna allow you to make all the mistakes that you would have made in the feature 
in the short film. And actually you're still gonna make a ton of mistakes in the feature, but hopefully they will be different mistakes. So you at least save yourself from the easy ones, right? Before we did Bad is Bad, we made this short film called The Big Idea. And it's not a coincidence that we filmed it in Chris's house, the same location. We used Chris, Kevin, and Alexis, the same actors. We used this camera dolly that we had built that we were gonna be using a ton in Bad is Bad. We made sure that worked. It was a revenge story about an inventor who stole somebody else's invention and gets killed, stabbed in the neck with a screwdriver. It's just all these things that we got to test out that we knew were gonna be big parts of Bad is Bad. We went into Bad is Bad with so much more confidence from having made that short. But that's not the only thing. The short film helped us get our director of photography. It helped us get the new actors that we had to reach out to. So this short is not only practice, it's also a calling card for you to get better talent attached to your feature. And speaking of getting better talent, my number three tip for you, inspire your cast and crew to work on your project for free. You need people to be volunteering their time and the only way they're gonna volunteer their time is if they're excited about your project, your story, and they like working with you and spending a long amount of time with you every single day. For us, we had me directing, we had a director of photography, we had a sound person, and we had a assistant camera. That's it. And of that crew, only Neil, our director of photography, actually had film industry experience. I had obviously made my own short films before, but other than like PAing on a film school project one time, I hadn't worked on any other sets before, so I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But Neil actually lived in another part of Virginia. We found him on Craigslist. We sent him our big idea, the short that we made before the feature. He liked it. We met up with him. He did some camera tests. And then I put this guy up in my parents' house across the hall from me. I don't know why my parents were cool with me bringing a stranger from Craigslist to live with us for three weeks, but amazingly, they were that supportive. And uh, he agreed to do it basically for free. We gave him like a $20 a day daily stipend. And then I gave him some back end points because we were so appreciative. And luckily enough for both of us, the film was successful enough that he got to see some income from the back end of the film. Now you're gonna feed people. Honestly, a lot of your budget's gonna go to food because you do not want people to be working hungry. So try to keep your days to a reasonable length of time. You don't wanna be doing back-to-back 16-hour -back days. Keep the vibe good. You don't want weird, uncomfortable tension. You're the captain of the ship. You have to inspire them to want to be there. And you have to not be an asshole. If they're not getting paid, no one's gonna put up with that. You have to look for freebies everywhere you can. Maybe you have a family friend who loves to cook and is willing to bring by a meal one day for the crew and cast. You know, all those things add up. Maybe you have a friend who has a bunch of equipment you can borrow. Any win like that is big. And the thing is, you actually have an advantage when you're making a movie for like no money because anytime you ask to borrow something, you can just say, hey, I'm making the movie for six grand. I have literally no money to pay for this camera but can you help me out? The worst they can say is no. So always ask, even if they say no, a lot of the times they'll be willing to help you out in some other way, just because people love to help other people out when they're working on a passion project, whether or not money's involved. So your enthusiasm is gonna be infectious and that's gonna be a major driver of completing this project. Streamline the production in every way possible. That's my fourth tip for you. This film, we had 100% storyboarded from beginning to end. We had a big fat binder. Every single shot in the film had a little picture, a little description, and we were ready for the next shot. It was just a matter of opening the binder, showing the director of photography. He was like, got it, we're moving on. Like, it was that easy. There was never any hesitation or confusion. The whole crew can look at that binder whenever they want and know what the day is gonna be like. Another big thing was to create a universal lighting setup in the kitchen. Most of the film takes place in Chris's kitchen. So what we did was we took these windows back here, put giant soft boxes behind them, just completely blew them out with white light. That way, no matter what time of day it was outside, no matter what the weather was like outside, we could continue shooting and it would all be consistent. We also had, I think, a light on the ceiling. To be honest, your director of photography like ours probably is not gonna be super psyched about making a universal lighting setup for your main location because no matter what, that means you're kinda of gonna be diluting the quality of each individual shot in that location. You know, normally you set up for somebody's close up. You're gonna get a key light in here, you're gonna get a backlight in here, you're gonna really try to make it pop and look exactly how you want it. But if you do a universal lighting setup, there's really not much tweaking you're gonna be doing. So on the plus side, you're moving very, very fast. It's just a matter of point the camera, start rolling, point the camera, start rolling. But on the downside, yeah, you're taking a little hit in the visual quality of your film, but my recommendation to you is that if you're trying to make your first feature and you don't have any money, 
take the hit on the visual quality in exchange for actually finishing your movie and having more time to make sure that your storytelling is at the highest level that you can pull off. People will forgive subpar visuals much more quickly than they will forgive subpar storytelling. And the other advantage of having that universal lighting setup was that we could shoot the movie basically in order. If you can shoot chronologically, you just saved yourself so much headache and so much time because now there's no continuity issues, your actors know exactly where they just came from, everybody's on the same page and you're just going bam, 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 so simple. Another thing we did was settle on an aesthetic that not only told the story the way that we thought it should be told, but would be easy for us to pull off logistically. So that meant a lot of wider shots, a lot of longer shots, shots and basically no coverage. So if you're getting coverage, that means you're recording, say a dialogue scene from like over one person's shoulder, over another person's shoulder, a two shot, a wide shot, a close up, a close up. You're covering your ass in the editing room so that you can always cut somewhere if something isn't working. Now, that's nice to have if you have that luxury, but let's be honest, we don't have that luxury. Time is money when you're making this movie. So what you need to do is be decisive about your vision for a scene and shoot exactly what you think you're gonna need. And maybe a little bit more, but not full coverage. Now, is that gonna be risky? Might you end up in the editing room with some problems? Yeah, it's possible. There's no way avoiding risk when you're making a feature film. But the plus side of not getting coverage is that you're gonna have a much more decisive, unique take on the scene, whether or not it pays off. That's up to the movie gods. But the best thing you can do when you're making a movie for no money is to take your creative vision and just like and Joaquin Phoenix and Signs just swing away. Just go for it as hard as you can because one of the strengths that you have when you have no money is you have a purity of your vision where other people aren't gonna be able to come in and water it down. So practice editing some scenes beforehand. While you're rolling, just be thinking like an editor, like I've got what I need, I can cut to the next angle, we're good, moving on. Constantly moving on and being decisive about whether or not you got what you needed. And that's it, we streamlined our production. We shot for 18 and a half days, and then we had one day of pickup shots, just little close-ups and inserts of things that we didn't have time for. It was a three-week shoot. We had a one day off a week, and then we had it in the can. But so far, we've talked about how to complete a movie for $6,000. Now let's talk about how do you make that movie a success? How do you get an audience for your $6,000 movie when there's a million movies out there that have bigger celebrities, bigger locations, bigger budgets, they have dinosaurs, they have explosions, they have nudity, they have dinosaurs with nudity and you just have you know a kitchen somewhere the trick to getting eyeballs on your movie in this day and age is to figure out a way to give yourself free publicity now what does that look like it can be anything from the story that you're telling there's some aspect of the story that's particularly unique and something that people would want to learn about or hear about or talk about it can be the people that are in your movie whether that's people that are well known people that are local to your area that are interesting that we haven't seen represented in films before it can be locations that are historical locations in your town it could be a type of setting that hasn't been seen in movies a lot before that you know it's about underwater coal miners. I don't think that's a thing, but if it was, you could try to film that movie. And then I'd be like, I've never seen an underwater coal miner movie before. What's that all about? The way that you made the movie, which for us was actually a major factor in getting attention for the film. It's a different part of your brain that you have to use from writing, but you do have to think about this while you're writing. What about my film is gonna make a stranger wanna give this a shot when they could go watch, you know, the Queen's Gambit or Tremors 2 or whatever's on Netflix at that time. For us, the way we made the movie was a huge thing. Like we were one of the first feature films to be shot entirely on a DSLR consumer level camera. And a lot of the films that were being made at that time with those cameras were this awful style of like super close up, 85 millimeter lens, wide open, razor shallow depth of field. So 90% of your film is out of focus and you're basically getting seasick while you're watching this stupid movie. So we took the opposite approach to that. We felt like that was just a temporary trend and we were right. We shot our movie very restrained, very wide, deep depth of field. And we kind of treated the DSLR more like a traditional film camera. And a lot of people took notice of the fact that this story was told with a DSLR camera and yet it didn't look like an out of focus, shaky piece of shit. So that was big. We also did something with the distribution of the movie that gave us a lot of free eyeballs, which is we just gave it away for free. And at the time, nobody was really doing that. We just put it up on YouTube and Vimeo and said, take it. Originally, we did want to get the big distribution deal. We wanted to go to Sundance. 
But in reality, what happened was we didn't really get into any film festivals. We didn't get any interest from distributors. I can go way in depth on that in another video, but it was a very dark time. And eventually we did decide to just, let's just put it up there. It'd be better to have exposure and to keep this sitting on a shelf for years, hoping for all the what ifs that we had imagined. And it was the best decision we ever made because I started emailing bloggers and online film critics. We got great reviews from the movie from some film critics and I plastered that all over the Vimeo page. I sent it to Philip Bloom, who's got a massive camera and filming blog. And he did a big post about the film and what's possible with DSLR filmmaking these days and the future of feature film distribution, how we just gave it away essentially. And that got us so much attention on Vimeo. I had like 50,000 views on Vimeo days after we released. And now it's like every month we get a little cheddar from it. People are still commenting, watching it every day. We were not prepared for the movie to get this much attention. It completely blew our minds. But you can do the same thing. You play to your strengths, your resources, your talents, and you're gonna be able to do something that does this or way better. Make your movie, even if you don't have anything, if you've got just a cell phone camera and your room, you can make a feature film. Check out Buried with Ryan Reynolds. The whole film takes place in a coffin, okay? Any of us could have made that movie. You don't need to have a million locations or people or explosions or naked dinosaurs. You can do it with what you have and your limitations. So get out there, make your movie, let me know how it goes. I have much more content coming about this case study and others. I've made 50 short films. I made a second no budget feature film that was not so successful. And there's some very interesting reasons why that one didn't do as well as this one. So subscribe, stay tuned for more. If this video was helpful in any way, hit that like button. Tell me in the comments, sign up for my email newsletter. I'm gonna be sending out resources you guys can use in the future. Anything that I think can help you guys make your best movies. So see you next week, stay tuned.